Today is Super Bowl Sunday. If you didn't know that, welcome to America. Glad you're here and hope you enjoy it. You know, it's what we do here on, on this Sunday of the, of the year. We watch the, the Super Bowl, apparently. Two teams are going head-to-head, two um, different styles of coaches. You know, the, and these coaches, how many of you are going for Rams? Any Rams, Rams? Where the, come on, let me hear you cheer. Rams, who's going to win? All right, how about the Patriots? Man, there's more Patriots fans in here. This, and and I, I love you guys, but I love to hate you. You know what I mean? You guys are so good. You're so good. Let someone else play football, okay? Just, I'm just kidding. I love you, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we have two different, like, like one is really experienced, right? Patriots, Bill Belichick, experienced, amazing, Hall of Fame coach, and then one up-and-coming young coach who is also just a really great strategist, and it's going to be really cool to see these two coaches go head-to-head. They've been planning now for weeks. They've been, and so before the football games, um, especially a game like this, a big game where they have time to plan, this is the, the championship game, these two coaches have been devising a strategy, a game plan to, and really the, the big game plans, there's multiple ones, but the big ones are they, they develop a defensive game plan and an offensive game plan. So they, they develop a unique defensive game plan going into the Super Bowl that they're facing this team, and they're, what they're thinking about is how do we stop that offense? What do we do? How do we cut them off? What are we going to do to defend, have a good game plan? And then offensively, they create a unique offensive game plan for their defense, and how can we get around what they're going to try to do? And it's this match. It's like a chess match, and it's really cool to see how it plays out, especially with great coaches, if you're a football, plan, a football fan, to see how the schemes that, that they will go into each Sunday with. Here's what I want to do in this series, you guys. I want to help you develop a game plan for your marriage. Your marriage needs, check this out, your marriage needs a defensive game plan and an offensive game plan. And, and, and many couples, they don't, they don't, many married people, they don't have a game plan for their marriage and if you don't have a game plan for your marriage, you will get gamed by the enemy's plan every time. The enemy has a plan for your marriage. He wants to destroy it. He wants to, to divide it. And that is, you, you need to be aware of that, that the enemy does. He's, he's out to destroy the fabric of marriage in our, in our country. And he's out for this relationship, to destroy this relationship. Here's what, in this series, you guys, I really, I'm really praying and believing that God is going to do something in married couples' lives, but anyone who is preparing for marriage, you may be even single, that God will help you in this season of your life. And there's even going to be some things that are applicable just to your stage, both in today and throughout this series. But, but we need a game plan, you guys. We need to, we need to go into this marriage thing with a defensive because we're living in a very offensive world. The enemy's plans and schemes against us, we need, we need a good defensive game plan to against... I mean. Look, the enemy's a better strategist than Bill Belichick, okay? He's better, and he's, he's going to come against you with a great scheme, a unique scheme for your life and for, and for your marriage. This is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. It actually said that sin is in a three-point stance, crouching at your door. <laughs> when I read that this, this, year, this week, I, I saw him, you know, I saw like the three-point stance. You know, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you, he says, but you need to have a game plan. But you need to master it. So we got to develop this game plan for this scheme that is coming at us. And that's what I want to do. Today, we're going to start with de- de- devising, developing a biblical defensive game plan for your marriage. Next week, we'll talk about an offensive game plan as well. But we're living in a world where, where just the Bible actually says that, the, that the, the devil is the God of this world. Little g, God, but he is the undermining force against you living for God, against you fulfilling your purpose, and against your marriage fulfilling what God wants it to fulfill. I was looking up some recent statistics of marriage. It says that almost 50% of all uh, marriages in the United States will end in divorce or separation. Researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages end in divorce 60% of second marriages end in divorce, 73% of all third marriages end in divorce, and the average first marriage that ends in divorce lasts about eight years. It says that every 13 seconds, there's a divorce in America. Every 13 seconds. You guys, you need a defensive game plan. So what I want to do today is give you 
a, is a, to help you divorce proof your marriage, to give you a, a, a divorce proof and a fair proof game plan for your marriage. Any married people want a divorce proof game plan? Come on, let me see it. Let me see it. You need a game plan. You need this game plan to divorce proof and a fair proof your marriage because no one goes into this thing thinking it's going to end that way. That for those 50% of marriages, they didn't go into it thinking that they're going to have an affair or that they were going to end in separation or divorce. And that's because they didn't have, a lot of them, a good game plan. So let me hover around this topic um, for just a few minutes. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14 actually says this. um, Because God created, God has a game plan. He created a game plan for humanity, like way, like a long time ago, called the Ten Commandments. He created like a game plan, you know, for, and and some of them are, are, I'm telling you, they're still good today. The seventh one says this, you shall not commit adultery. Kind of a defensive game plan. It's just really straightforward. Jesus took it like a little bit further. And this is one of those verses in Matthew chapter five, that kind of like, ow, Jesus, (laughs) why'd you have to say it like that? Let me, let me just, I don't know if you read the Bible sometimes and you say, ow, it's like, whoo. Look at this. You have heard that it was said, Jesus said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, that word lustfully means to covet, that you're looking at someone, same, same word in the, in the Old Testament, we're talking about coveting your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's belongings. Anyone who looks at a woman coveting after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what he's saying is, look, Adultery doesn't, doesn't, it's not a big, it doesn't begin in the outward action. It actually begins way before that in your heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. And then he says, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, talking about coveting now, like reaching for things that aren't yours. Cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So it's just one of those verses that you probably don't hear preached a lot. And let me kind of set the record straight here, okay? <clears throat> Jesus isn't like advocating for you to take a knife and gouge out your eye, okay? It's not what he's saying at all. This is hyperbole. He's using hyperbole to make a point here of the devastating nature of this sin. Now, all sin is sin. All sin is separation from God, but there is nothing like, please listen to me, there is nothing like sexual sin. It, it affects you to your soul. Nothing, nothing affects your soul like sexual sin. And he's trying to draw this great distinction. And a lot of people, you, you may be here today, maybe you don't, maybe you're not a Christian, a follower of Jesus. I don't know what stage of life you are, but I talk to some people sometimes, and especially people that don't follow Christ about this subject and about sex in particular. And they say, well, why would God give me these urges? If he didn't want me to fulfill, I'm like, what's wrong with it? I'm just satisfying. This is, this is what God, like some people think that God is like a big old fuddy-duddy, doesn't want me to have any fun. That's what he, God's not, that's not God's plan. God created, you guys know God created sex, right? He created sex. He actually created it to be fun. You know, sexual ecstasy, that was God. God did that. He's cool. God is, isn't that cool? God created that. And some people think that, that, that God created sex like post Post the fall, post Adam and Eve sin, like that's when sex came in. No, sex was like before that, uh, all right? Which is funny, you think about it, because there was no shame. Adam and Eve were naked and had no shame. And God used to walk in the garden, and I just, my mind is, may not be like, but I just, you know, (laughs) what God's walking into sometimes, you know? The bushes are rustling, and God's just like, oh my me. You know, he can't say, oh my God. So he's like, oh my me, oh my me. (laughs) Wow. You got to have a little bit of fun with this topic, you guys. I'm trying here. But some people are like, well, that's easy for you to say stuff like that. Oh, holy God. Oh, sexless one. It's easy for you. But you gave me these urges. And now you're just like telling me not to fulfill them. No, look, God, God created sex and he created it to be good. And man and sin has manipulated, distorted and confuse this thing, and because of that, it has created so much devastation, AIDS and STDs and, prom- and promiscuity, and even things like nowadays, polyamory is a thing. You know what that is? Where you have more than one spouse, more than one you know, lover. You're living with like three wives or three husbands. It's, that is g- gaining steam. It is gaining more and more popularity because man has twisted and distorted this thing. You want to know how to, how to keep it in God's plan, in God's design? Keep it in marriage. Here. 
The principle, limit sex to marriage. I just want to put it to you really plainly. It ain't, it is not popular. It's not cool in culture. I don't care. Okay. And God's not, God's not trying to limit your life. He's trying to, he's trying to protect your heart, he's trying to guard your soul. You need a defensive game plan in a very offensive world. John 8, 44 says this about the devil, that there's no truth in him. There's no truth in Satan. When Satan lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. So the Bible says he schemes. Like he's, he knows us very well. He knows you well. He devises very intentional, strategic plans to try to trip you up, to try to tempt you, to try to come after your marriage and your kids and your family and check it out. Parents, please don't be naive. Don't be, look, there is an enemy. Sin is crouching at their door. They, your kids know about this stuff. They're hearing about it at school. They're seeing it from the media. Don't be naive. Parents, please don't be naive. It's all around us. Be aware. Wake up, parents. Wake up. You need a defensive game plan for your kids. Not only for your, for your own marriage, but you need a defensive game plan for your kids because it's an offensive world and they're in it. They're in it. And I hope I'm, help, I hope I'm speaking some, some, some wake-up call into some parents that need to really get a defensive game plan. If we treated, if we treated you know, this drug education like sex education in school, we would be handing out needles to the kids going, okay, I know we can't help. You're going you're gonna to try drugs. You're going to be a, a drug addict. But here's a needle. Just be a safe, just to practice safe drug use, okay? That's what we would do. Oh, we can't stop you from having sex. Here's a condom. Here, have a condom. Just have safe sex. The only safe sex there is is married sex. Can I get an amen, somebody? I know it's not popular. I know it's not cool, but God's word is true. It's true. And I'm just kind of, I need to call us back to this. Whether you're single, you're married, I need to call you back to God's standard and to God's word. Um, there, the enemy is, is a liar, a schemer. And, he's, and there are, in my experience in, in kind of married life, marriage counseling, I've seen probably a lot of lies that people buy into that really causes them to break their vows. I'm calling this part of the marriage when the vows break. Really what happens when we break those vows that we made, we buy into some lies of the enemy. And let me give him, I just kind of put them in like a cat, three different categories of lies that we believe that cause us to break our vows with the ones that we made vows with. Write them down with me. Here's the first one I'm just calling the wedding lie. The wedding lie where we, this one is just like where we, we say, I married the wrong person. I married, I married the wrong person. It was too fast. Uh, we got married too fast. We should have waited. We should have waited longer. Uh, but now that I met this person, it's really different. Wow. I mean, I was in love, but maybe I wasn't in love. Maybe I fell out of love, but now I'm in love over here. And we talk about love like it's falling in a ditch or something. You don't fall in love. You choose. You choose love. And that's part of the problem is I think that we don't, we don't have a good understanding of what love is. That in, in our English vocabulary, we use the same word to describe our affection and feeling and devotion to our spouse that we do our food. I love my wife and I love pizza. It's the same word. Obviously, it's different, you know, but I think we've diluted this love. And we don't, we don't understand that love is a choice. Love is a choice. And not only that, love, the Bible tells us love is a person. That God is love. God created this thing. He didn't create just sex, but he created this union of marriage. And listen, it does not work without him. It can't work without him. You don't have the right and necessary tools to succeed in this thing God created without God. He is an essential ingredient, love, the person of God to be in your marriage. But this is a lie that we'll believe, the, the wedding the wedding lie. Here's, here's the next lie, is, is the feelings lie. The feelings lie where, oh, I just, I got to go with my heart. Just my, I got to go with, I got to go. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Okay, you can't listen to your heart. You can't listen to your feelings. Your feelings will lie to you. We don't walk by feeling. We walk by faith. That's how we walk. God, well, God wants, I'm miserable. You don't understand. I'm miserable and I deserve to be happy. God wants me happy. No, he don't. God doesn't care about your happiness. That's a lie. God don't care about your happiness. He wants you to be obedient. 
Okay, all right? God wants, it's like my kids never feel like going to school. Parents, am I wrong? They never feel like going to school, but I don't let them lead their life by their feelings. We're going to lead by choice here. You're going to make the choice to go. You're going to get, get up, get your shoes on, okay? You don't lead your life by feelings. And it's a feelings lie that you got to follow your heart. Your heart's lying to you, dude. It's lying to you, man. You don't lead with your, you lead with your choices with your faith. Your heart will follow, but you lead it with faith, okay? Your wedding lie, the feelings lie. Here's the next one. It's just the, the denial lie where it's like, it's not that big a deal. You know, well, we ain't doing nothing. We just, we just talking. We just talking. It's just, it's just, or, or it's not a big deal. It's, there's nothing really wrong. It's fine. It's fine. And we just, we, we play this denial lie and tell you that these lies I see show up in relationships and the enemy is trying to convince us um, to dishonor the vows and the covenant of marriage. And I'm praying and believing that in this, it's starting today in these next several weeks that God is going to do something fresh and new and reinvigorating and restoring in your relationships, in your marriage, and some of you that are planning on it or want to get into it, that God is going to set you up for success in this area. Regardless of what challenges you face, you can have a healthy marriage with the right game plan. Let me give you today a defensive game plan, a biblical defensive game plan. Write some notes with me today, you guys. Here's where we have to start. Number one is make a commitment to God's standard. Man, I'm calling the church, calling all of us back to the word of God. The culture and God's word are not always going to agree with each other, are they? They don't line up. It's, it's at the times, it's at that crossroad where culture says one thing and then God's word says something very unpopular, very countercultural. At that crossroad actually determines what God you serve. What do you choose? Do you serve the God of this world or do you serve the God of heaven and earth, the one true God? Which way are we going to go? I'm calling you guys back to a standard of, even if it's unpopular, even if it's uncool, that we would choose God, just agree with God's word and his plan for our life. Psalm 139 says this, how can a young man keep his way pure? You're young, young man, young woman, you're single. You want to know how to live for God and be pure in your walk with God? One way, by committing and living according to God's word. So this is the first part of a defensive game plan, you guys, is that we just got to put a stake in the ground and say, you know what? I'm going to let the word of God be my standard. I'm not going to make it up myself. I'm not going to choose this or that or some parts of it. I'm going to, God's way works and I'm choosing God's way. I'm choosing his standard for my life. Amen? Amen. Here's number two, defensive game plan. Part two is become more aware of your choices. Become aware of your choices. Every choice you make is making you. Every choice, it's making you. And, and we are all, I like to say, we are all just one choice away from stupid. Okay? Uh, it's it, one choice. It takes, it takes a lifetime to build your reputation, to build your career, to build your calling, but it takes one choice to destroy it, doesn't it? One choice to tear it down. We're just, and it, but it doesn't start there, does it? No one, no one just wakes up and decides to destroy their reputation, or their marriage. No one just wakes up from a healthy, happy marriage and, and just wakes up one day and goes, you know what? I'm going to develop desires for another woman today. I'm going to leave my wife today. I'm going to devastate my kids today. No one ever does that. It shows up, though, in the small, compromising, daily choices. We need to, if you want, look, I'm trying to give you a defensive game plan. You need to become more aware of those choices, those small compromising choices. Oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I can go, I can go there. I can have lunch with that person. I can, I can have a conversation that they don't know about with this. And it's the small rationalization is an enemy of a healthy marriage where you rationalize, right? Well, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody's doing it. Or this one, this one. As long as I don't get caught, as long as she doesn't know I'm looking at that stuff, what's the big deal? I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. She doesn't, he doesn't know that, that 
look, you're not going to wake up and just decide to do it. It's in these small, rationalized choices that you're making. We need to become more aware of the choices that we're making and that the choices that are making us. And we, we like to magnify the pleasure of these choices, the small, com- it's okay. We magnify that and we minimize the consequences. And I'm just, we need to flip that, you guys. We got to magnify the consequences and minimize the sin. Like make, make those consequences bigger in your mind, bigger in reality, magnify the result of those things. Proverbs chapter 6, 32 says this, but a man who commits adultery, this is what's wrong. They lacked choices, the choice management. They lacked judgment. Whoever does so is not just hurting their spouse or their kids or their family they're actually destroying themselves i'm actually they're actually inflicting self wound because no damage there is no damage like the damage of sexual sin there is no damage to the soul than there is like sexual sin become more aware of your choices here's another one for your game plan defensive game plan number 3 is maintain the marriage and you know that your marriage takes routine maintenance. Any married people would agree that it takes work? Anyone says take work? Does that amen somebody? Does that take work? It takes work to have a healthy marriage. It takes some maintenance. It just doesn't doesn't happen without some intentionality. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about this next week when we talk about an offensive game plan, the things that we need to do. We don't just play defense, man. We need to get on the offense and invest into and sow into our marriages. One guy told me one time, he said, Pastor, I'm sorry, the fire is gone. The fire is just out. It's gone out. Like it's the fire's problem, right? That's not the fire's problem that the fire is out. It's like looking at a fireplace and going, that dumb fireplace fire went out, man. That bad fireplace, bad. That's not the fireplace's problem. What you need to do is throw another log onto that fire, right? You don't, you don't need to call it quits on that marriage, man. What you need is get a match, bro. <laughs> Light that thing. Get yourself a log, all right? And Light that thing up again. What you need to do is go out into the cold. Go out into the cold. Get, get, get that log. Put, dust all the, 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 the stuff off it. You're in Bakersfield. You guys don't know nothing about this. But you need to go out to the cold where it's shivering. It takes some work to keep the fire going. And although it takes work to keep the fire going, it takes a lot more work to start it once it's gone out. But can I speak to any marriage that is here today? You say, you know what? The fire is gone. The fire is out. Listen, although it's easier to... to get a fire going more that hasn't gone out, it is still possible to put a match on that thing, go get some wood and restart a fire in your fireplace, sir. It's still, it's still possible to get that fire going again, ma'am. It's not, it's not over. You just have to maintain the marriage. It takes maintenance. It takes work. I'm gonna talk to you about that next week. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse three. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise, the wife to her husband. And this is where the husband's like, see, 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 honey. See, I, that's, I knew it was in there. Write that one down. First Corinthians 7, verse 3. A lot of, a lot of husbands or wives or whatever, they, they'll point to this as like as the sex verse. Like you're supposed to do your marital duty. Man, come, look, you can't expect her just to get all excited, all right, just at the drop of, no, at the at the, I was going to say something bad, at the drop of your draws. And I'm just kidding, I'm sorry. I said it, I went there. You can't expect to get all, ex- <laughs> this duty is more than that kind of duty. It takes a lot more duty, okay, than, than just her to get all excited after you never, someone said that sex, sex doesn't begin in the bedroom, it begins in the kitchen, okay? And some of your mind went there. I wasn't talking about that. It can, but that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about where you go, honey, I'll do the dishes. Don't worry about that. Mm. You do those dishes, boy. You never. It's where she comes home and you're vacuuming. Right? You never look sexier with that vacuum. (laughs) Come on, baby. Get that living room done. You got got more duty than that, man. It takes takes work. You got to maintain this thing, you got to do your marital duty more than what you think it probably, probably is. Here's number four, defensive game plan. Number four, become accountable to someone. Accountability is not like, it's not a scary word or a bad word. Check it out. You need it. You need people in your life, you guys, that because the Bible says, and it's true, that the heart is deceitfully wicked. 
above all things, it says. That means that I can fool myself. Do you know that? That's what it means to be deceitful in my heart. That means that I can fool myself. And we do that often. We fool ourselves all the time. You look in the mirror and go, yeah, you are. You fool. No, I'm just kidding. But you do different. We fool ourselves and we say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I'm not that. I'm not, it's, it hasn't, that's not me. That's, and we just, we fool ourselves. Why? Because our heart is deceitful, you guys. You can't trust your heart. That's why you need people in your life who are deep enough, who are close enough, who know your heart, who know your thoughts. Because if you're the only one who knows what you're really feeling and knows what you're really thinking, then you're in trouble. You need people who are close enough to where when you get asked, how are you doing? And you say, I'm all right, that they know. I said, no, you're not. Come on, what's going on? You need people close enough that know you that way, that can hold you accountable to what's going on in your heart and in your mind. An important ingredient to the defensive game plan is having people close enough to be accountable that what's going on in my heart and what's going on in my mind. Because it's better to catch it in your thought life before it manifests in real life. Are you hearing me, church? Okay. That's where it needs to be caught. Because we're, look, we're living in a broken world and you, got, you have a flesh and carnal nature. There's going to be feelings and thoughts and that's where it needs to be caught and crucified. That's where it needs to be brought into the obedience of Christ as right in your heart when you feel it, when you think it and you need people to help you because your heart is deceitful and manipulative. You need people to help you sometimes show you yourself, show you your own thoughts to go, hey, call you to the carpet. What are you doing telling that joke? Hey, what are you doing going out to lunch with her? You know you're married. What are you doing? You need, to, you need someone to call you out when you're deceiving yourself. Look at James chapter 1. He actually talks about this, about the, the difference here. But each one is tempted when? By his own evil desire. See, it's within me. I'm dragged away and enticed. But then after the desire has conceived, you see, I didn't have anyone in my life to show me that. I was... I, 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 I didn't have anyone to call it out while it was there in my heart or there in my mind. So what it did is it, it, it gave birth to sin. And then he goes on and says, and then sin gives birth to death, he says. See, the way where you catch it is, in your, is it where, in your heart or in your mind before it gives birth to sin and eventually destroys you and gives birth to death in your life, the death of your marriage. See, there's really no such thing as a one-night stand, is there? Because it begins in your mind way before that. It begins when you fantasize and you're watching that stuff and you're thinking about that stuff and you need, pe- you need people close. This is why small groups exist at Discovery Church. You got to have some friends in your life that, are, that, that love God and who, and, and who want the best, want to see God's best in you and for your marriage. And they're going to tell you the hard truth. They're going to not only celebrate with you, but they're going to tell you the hard truth sometimes that we need to hear. All right, here's number five, last one. And then we're going to talk about some responses Hey, we need to draw a line. We need to draw a line and stay far, a far distance behind it. Now, I'm not advocating for like legalism or religiosity or any of those. Now, lines can become that, but lines are also, listen, guys, lines are for your protection. Everyone in here, you need to know your line. You need to know your line. You need to know where the line is for you, and you need to know where you cannot cross. And everybody's going to be different. For some of you, you know you can't go to the gym. For my friend, I have a really good friend, a pastor, an executive pastor. For years, he's been my friend. He does not go to the beach. He says, Jason, there's too much skin at the beach. I can't go to the beach. And he knows his line. He knows himself. For some of you, you know you can't be alone with this person or with that coworker. You can't be. You just need to know your line and stay far distance behind it. Everybody has a different line. And it's for your benefit that you would know it. You guys need, look, you need a defensive game plan. You got to have a game plan because the enemy's game in you. He's got a plan to scheme against your marriage, and you got to have a defensive game plan against it. So let, let me give you so, this is just me. This is my line. I have, a def- I have a defensive game plan. I have some lines that I've drawn with my wife, and I said, this is, I'm going to protect my marriage. I'm going to protect my integrity. I'm going to protect my calling and, the, and, and, and that of Discovery Church. I'm going to draw a line because. And, I, and so let me just show you the lines that I've drawn. These don't need to be your lines. I'd encourage you to make some lines. These might be. You may want to adopt some of these lines, but this is just my lines. Let me just show you the 10 commandments of marital commitment for Pastor Jason Hannes. Here it is. Commandment number one. You need to take some extra notes if you want to, okay? I shall have no other human relationships before Veronica, including the kids. 
And the kids know that. The kids know that they go after Veronica. They don't come before Veronica. They know. Check it out. This may hurt some of you mamas in the room, maybe even some of you dads. The kids know I love mama more than I love them. They know I love them to death, and I'll do anything for them. I would die for my kids. I will chase them down to the end of the world. If they ever try to think about leaving the fold and the flock of Jesus, I will be there to hunt them down. I am for them. They know it, but they know that I love mama first and I love mama more. And that's not hurting them. I promise you it doesn't hurt them at all. What it does, it gives them a picture of the man that they will choose. They'll choose a man that loves God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and loves them the way daddy loves mama. Come on, somebody. You see that, okay? This is the covenant marriage and relationship that God has established. This is just something that, that we just draw the line. It ain't happening. No, no friends, no other relationships, not even the kids, not going to come before me and my wife. No way. Here's number two. This is just me. This is my line. I've drawn it. Remember your date night and keep it holy. You got you to gotta, you date your spouse, man. And some of you need to re, restart that thing up, man. You need to get back on that, on that dating wheel consistently. It may not even be a date night for, some of, for, for my wife and I, because she co-pastors Discovery with me. We do a date breakfast, a date lunch. It's on Monday when it's our day off. And the kids are at school, and we have a great time. Monday, Mondays are the best, let me just tell you. I love our Mondays. I love my, I covet my Monday. It is holy to my, for, for me, but for my wife as well, for me and my wife together. That's, you remember the date night. I'm just trying to help you guys. Number three, here you go. Honor your anniversary and special days so that you may live long in the land that the Lord has given you. <laughs> now, this one here is, is, is a hard one for me. Because I'm not like a special day kind of person. I'm not a gifts kind of person. I'm not all that stuff. It just doesn't come. But guess what? Veronica is. So guess what? I am. <laughs> so I've learned, you know, it just wasn't, I learned the hard way, trust me, I'm, that my wife loves flowers. She loves chocolates. She, she loves gifts. I know, like Valentine's Day, some of you guys are like, that's a corporate, blah, blah, blah. You, come on, man. You just take the opportunity to invest into your marriage that our anniversary, that Valentine's, take that opportunity, okay? I've come to the point now where I just know, man, there's got to be fresh flowers in the house. There just is, man. I just, it's gotten to that point. If, if the flowers are, are like dying too much and she's got to throw them away before I got fresh ones, I missed it. I messed up, man. I'm like, dang it. I missed my opportunity. I got to go rush to the store and get them. I'm just, that's my line, okay? I'm just trying, that's what I, that's more offensive. But these are, number four, number four, I shall not take the covenant of marriage in vain by apathy, where I just treat it of little concern, of no interest, of no investment, my covenant relationship. Number five, I shall not ride in a car or eat in a restaurant alone with a member of the opposite sex. I'm not going to do it. Some of you are single. You can probably, that's maybe not a line for you, but for me, I'm a married man. I have no business being in a car alone with another woman or being at a restaurant or a coffee shop alone. I don't care if it's ministry. I don't care. Oh, but uh, I'm serving them and I'm ministering to them. You better let someone else minister to that person. You better, you got to, and look, it's not because you may read this or think about this stuff. You're like, oh, Pastor Jason, he's just very, he must have some issues. No, it's not because I have like issues with this at all. It's, it's because I know I'm human and I'm one step away from, from stupid. Okay. I've seen too many pastors fall. I've seen too many leaders fall and I'm going to guard. I'm going to have a defensive game plan so I can make it. Look, I don't want to just play church, y'all. I don't want to just play church and show up on Sundays. Man, I want to get to the finish line in this thing. I want to get to the finish line with discovery, with my calling, with my wife, and with my kids with me. So in order to do that, i got to have a game plan. And this is just part of it. Number six, I shall not travel alone. I don't do it. I take my wife with me. If she can't come with me, I take a pastor with me or someone with me. It's just This is just one of my... One of my defensive game plans, because no one is ever going to have to wonder, what was he doing alone in that hotel room? What was he doing alone in that, in that state or in the, over there in that country? No one will ever have to wonder, because I, I have someone in the hotel room with me, all right? There is no perspective of even evil or room for the enemy to come in, because I don't travel alone. I travel with a companion, okay? Again, this is just my line. You need a line. I don't know what your line is, but it's me as Pastor Jason, the pastor and the husband. Number seven. I shall not counsel a woman with the door closed. I don't do it. And honestly, I don't even counsel 
a woman more than once. I'll meet with a woman once, but after that, if she's married, the husband has to come with her if she wants me to continue to minister to her. If not, we got great women and great pastors that will, that will minister to you, but I'm not going to give room for someone to develop feelings and develop. That's not going to happen. I, I, don't, I cancel with the door open, and I only do it once alone with a woman. Number eight, you guys may think this is like, a, a, you guys, I just, I'm protecting this thing, man. I'm drawing a line. I'm staying way far away from it. The seven is connected to this one. I shall not share the details of our marriage with others. Obviously, this is not including your accountability partner or when you go to get counseling, but I'm not going to share the details of my marriage, especially with a member of the opposite sex or where, where the enemy can, can work in there and develop some affection or consolation. No, no, that's a line. Number nine. I shall not watch, read, or expose myself to sexually explicit shows, books, or videos. I get it's normalized. I get everybody watches it. I get it's, I, oh, it's such a great movie. It's such a great, I'm sorry, not for me. I'm going to draw a line. I'm just going to draw a line because I got a lot to lose. I don't know about you and what your line is, but this is my line. Number 10, just kind of summing it up. I shall remember the implications of breaking my covenant relationship, and that's something I'll do. I'll do occasionally is I'll rehearse the implications, like the, the consequences that would ever happen if I would ever slip up, if I would ever, I, what I would do to my calling, to my God, to my wife, to my kids, I will remember. See, I don't know where your line is, but you need one. Okay. So there's a la, last feelings here. There's three different responses to a message like this that you could have today. And, and you may be in one of these three boats of, of responses. The first two I would encourage you not to have. It's probably a human feeling that you're having right now, some of you, but it's the third response I think you need to have, okay? And that first response that you might have to a message like this is where you get defensive, where you just say, no, 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 that's not me. It's not that big of a deal. Well, I'm, I'm in love with him, but I'm in love with him, but, but you don't know. You know I'm miserable, and you get all defensive, and, and but you, you got, your wife's a pastor. You don't know my situation, or my wife, or my husband, and you, and you get all defensive. Listen, that's rebellion. That is a rebellious heart, and you need to soften your heart. Ma'am, sir, that's not the right response to God's word, to get defensive. Or, or your second response, and, your, and just your carnal nature could just be to get lost, where you go run, you go hide. You, 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 go, you go get away from it all. Uh, you may even lose yourself in the process where you leave. Get defensive, get lost. Here's what, you, what we need to do after a message like this. We need to get a game plan, church. Like today, to start a fresh, a new game plan because the enemy has a plan for your, for your marriage. He has a plan for your, for, and the whole world system is in on it. It's time for you and I to develop a biblical game plan for our marriage to succeed. And it may just start today with you changing your direction. For some of you, you feel like you've been, some of your marriages have been drifting apart, going in opposite directions for too long, and, and you need to change your direction. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 7 actually says, godly sorrow brings repentance. See, that godly sorrow is called conviction. Where after a message like this, you'd feel like, ooh, that pricks, and, and I sense that, and I need to make it, I need to change. I need to change my direction. That's what repentance means. Change my direction. That's godly sorrow. The other responses, getting lost, getting defensive, that's condemnation, where you're feeling like condemned. And I want you to know that's a lie of the enemy. God does not condemn you. I do not condemn you. You are loved and welcomed here no matter your choices, your background, your whatever. You are loved, accepted, and welcomed here by God, by me, and by this church. You need to know that. That condemnation is not of God. But godly sorrow, conviction, makes us change our direction. Repentance that leads to salvation. And it leaves no regret behind. You won't regret it. It'll be the best choice you ever made. But worldly sorrow, that condemnation, will bring death. And some of you need to, after a message like this, you just need a game plan. It'll start today, possibly, by changing your direction. Can we do that together with every head bowed?